Hello and welcome to GeekCast Radio presents an interview that will also be syndicated on Alter Geek and Studio 2009. I'm one of your hosts for this evening, Steve Megatron, and joining me is my usual partner in podcasting crime, TFG1 Mike. Hello. Coming to the studio tonight is Scott Bradley, and if you're not familiar with Scott, he's a podcaster knowledgeable in all things horror. The host of the Hellbent on Horror podcast, and he's also the author of Screaming for Pleasure. And if that's not enough, he's been featured on Sci-Fi Wire and many other media places. Hello, Scott, and welcome to the show. Hi, folks. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you for being here. And during the high holidays here, Halloween, that is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perfect <laughs> timing, too, you know. Yes, we usually, you know, have a good sense of timing around here. <laughs> well, it, it was also <laughs> beneficial because your your contact uh, I met through podcast movement. Oh, wonderful! Sa- uh, yeah, Sarah, right? Yeah, yeah, and it was it was great because we were on you know watching a couple of different panel things, and then she reached out to me, and I was like, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was a kind of a. Uh, uh, a work and fate of for the time of year it is. <laughs> it's amazing how it happens that way. I do find that uh, if you uh, open yourself to whatever's going on out there, you tend to find people who are at least curious about oh, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, totally. So, Mike, I mean, without further I do ado. A... Yeah. What were you going to say, Scott? Sorry. <laughs> I was just basically going to say uh, that uh, I find that uh, with uh, doing a horror podcast, whenever I speak to people about Hellbent for Horror and they ask me what I'm doing and, and I say, oh, I, I talk about all things horror, half of the time it's, uh, oh, wow. And the other half, it's like, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> and, <laughs> and what I find is that in both directions, whenever I have a conversation like that, uh, whether someone really likes horror or they don't, we talk about the same amount of time, about 20 minutes go by before uh, we realize the time has passed because it's a very passionate subject, whether you like it or not. Uh, you find that you probably have uh, distinct opinions about it. And I find that a lot of the people who listen to my show uh, will start getting in touch with me by way of email. And they'll start the email by saying, I'm not really a horror fan, but... And they somehow stumbled upon what I was doing. And uh, just starting a conversation is what I usually try to do. And it's amazing how much uh, you uh, can really get into that passion, that geek passion that goes through any kind of pop culture. But it really does. Uh, there's something universal about horror that people definitely have an opinion. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually funny because um, some of us on, on this network have a higher or lower opinion or kind of indifferent uh, in general on it. But it's, it's, uh, it is true. Everybody pretty much has an opinion on that one genre over many of the others. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the genre is uh, – I'm a genre guy first off, but, and I like to say that uh, I've always been in love with the cinema uh, and that uh, I love all kinds of movies. My heart belongs to the horror film, and it's because it uh, connected with me very early, and I like to say that people have a first kiss with horror and sometimes it doesn't go well <laughs> and sometimes it does <laughs> and uh, that passion uh, can uh, – color how you look at the entire genre i find that people who dislike horror tend to look at it from the movie that they hated or that they were scared by and they assume that all of horror is going to be that and people who are huge fans tend to think that all horror movies should be exactly like the one that they love and that's the only thing that horror is and both of those ways are quite limiting the reality is horror is truly universal there's a story out there for everyone and i assure you that it isn't all about gore and it isn't all about dread and it, uh, there are some there's some story out there that is waiting for you to be able to be uh, a release from the pressure cooker of life it's certainly an interesting way of putting it <laughs> that i've never thought of <laughs> yeah exactly so as we get started could you tell our listeners a little bit about your background Sure. Well, uh, I am an author, a speaker, and a podcaster. As mentioned before, I have a podcast called Hellbent for Horror. Uh, I'm here to remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. And that podcast is about everything that's related to horror. I talk about horror as art and social commentary. I talk about movies and 
the books and stories and even music that shaped me. I, I like to talk about how music is a lot like horror as well, or vice versa. And that all of that stuff shapes horror as a film style and an art form. Culture uh, changes art, art changes culture. And the book, Screaming for Pleasure, How Horror Makes You Happy and Healthy, <laughs> is a love letter to all those things that go bump in the night. But not only that, it's about how horror uh, reinvents itself to reflect each generation's anxieties that can also be healing as well as thrilling. I think that horror is one of the most diverse and beautiful storytelling styles that we have. It may be one of the oldest storytelling styles. It's also tailor-made for allegory. It's tailor-made for metaphor. And it really allows us to talk about uncomfortable subjects that we'd never sit to watch in a straight drama. So it allows for this visceral exploration of what makes us human. It talks about the uh, emotions that sometimes we don't want to look at. Uh, the Jungian style of the shadow self. Having a, a healthy, safe handshake with that part of us that everybody has. It gives us a place to confront our own monsters that can't be ignored. A lot of times we look to uh, science fiction for allegory and metaphor as well, and horror goes on the other side of that. And I think horror and science fiction ask two specific questions of the human uh, experience. Uh, science fiction asks, how are we going to live with technology? What is it going to do to us? And horror asks, where are monsters from? And the answer is almost always uh, right between our eyes or in our heart or in our stomach uh it tends to come from us wow or the internet <laughs> yeah and the internet <laughs> well it's it kind of bleeds both you know sci-fi and horror <laughs> Yes, I took it as a hybrid vigor is one of the great things about horror. It's like I look at it as like uh, Frank's Red Hot. It goes with everything. You basically just put a dash here and there. And horror is like a magnificent mutt. It allows itself uh, – hybrid vigor is the idea of uh, mutt versus a purebred. Purebred would be uh, the, the thing that you know what it's going to be. It's very dependable, uh, and uh, it does have its issues. If you continue to do the same thing again and again and again, it kind of destroys the gene pool. Uh, the idea of hybrid vigor is your mutts get together, and you find the best of all of those uh, breeds coming together, and you have something surprising. And horror does mix with comedy. It mixes with science fiction. It mixes with – uh, the uh, drama westerns, you can find anything because it's not really uh, about a setting. Horror is an emotion first and a setting later. It really is all about what kind of emotions uh, it can evoke from you. And so I look at it as, yeah, science fiction uh, and horror. Uh, they're they're uh, strange bedfellows sometimes, but they really go together very well. Alien would be a great example. Mm hmm. So what what specifically uh drove you into the the genre and like was it a specific film was it um certain type of music was what what was it that kind of drove you into it that's a great question because I was a scaredy cat as a kid. I was afraid of everything. And uh, I grew up uh, as a child. My parents were in a fundamentalist Christian cult, basically. I thought that the world was going to end in 1975. Uh, it didn't. So that was kind of embarrassing for everybody, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was one of those things where we are afraid of everything. I was taught to be afraid. And early on, I saw a movie that I shouldn't have seen. And so I saw this movie that was out in the 1970s called Don't Look Now. And uh, it's not very well known except for in horror and art films, actually, uh, in those uh, areas. People are big on this film uh, because it has one of the most disturbing beginnings to it. And it's about a couple of parents who unwittingly let their child drown in the backyard. And it was this really artistic, very strange, surreal, time-bending storyline. And I saw it when I was eight by mistake. My parents were in process of <laughs> getting divorced, and they were having arguments, and they just basically gave me the TV as a babysitter. And we just happened to have a uh, home box office when it was very early, when it was just starting out. And so this movie was on in the middle of the day, and it shouldn't have been on. And I watched it, and I went into shock. It was a child about my age drowning and the parents uh, running out trying to save her and this very weird look and i was i had nightmares for three nights in a row but what ended up happening was i kind of felt like for the first time i felt kind of seen the thing that was scary wasn't that a, a child drowned that was of course kind of frightening but the thing was parents couldn't save the kid 
And so I suddenly realized, you know, at that age, obviously I'm not articulating this, but what I got was that I was suddenly calm about how I could not control anything in my life. I mean, the fact that I was in this religion where demons were in every closet and my parents are getting divorced and my life is splitting apart, I didn't understand any of it and it was out of my control. But all of a sudden being scared was controllable. It was controllable by watching a movie that allowed me to look at the things that were frightening me and endure them and make it through to the other side. And I always had the choice to shut it off. And for some strange reason, that worked for me. And I found that there's a contingency of people who love horror films uh, that had experiences somewhat like that, maybe a little bit older in their life, whatever it was, they felt connected to uh, the extreme of a horror film. And it really does come down to I don't want to do these things, but I do uh, enjoy the experience of finding myself being able to endure the uncomfortable thing. And I like to look at it in that Jungian way, which is uh, that we all have a shadow self. It is this thing that is boiling inside of us. Uh, we have the persona, which is the, th the face we put on to be liked, <laughs> like what I'm doing right now. Uh, but then there is uh, the shadow self, which is that internal little lizard brain. And it's there for everyone, and it functions. It has a function for us. It allows us to know right and wrong. It allows us to have a conscience. But it is something that needs to be indulged every so often. If you ignore the shadow, uh, Jung says you do that at your own peril. In other words, if you uh, ignore the fact that you have this thing, sooner or later it bursts to the, the forefront. It is a spoiled brat. And the next thing you know, you're getting divorced, you're, you're in trouble for embezzling, whatever it might be, that dark side takes over. And so the horror film and other ways of working with the shadow is like a safe handshake. It allows us to examine this part of us which feels dark and say, okay, I accept that that's there. Uh, I'm able to get over some shame about that, perhaps. Whatever it might be, the horror film allows me to uh, have uh, the ability to look at things that I may not want to look at in the bright daylight. Uh, but the horror film allows me to look at what's happening in my culture. You know, at any given point, if you look at the horror films uh, from even the 30s onward, even the worst ones, the ones that only showed on drive-ins at midnight, those movies do... <laughs> stamp uh, the time and the history of what's happening in the culture at that moment. Mm -hmm. They need to know what makes us anxious. So they will exploit what is anxious. So you can literally see how it's almost like an exorcism. It's like music. Music isn't something that you intellectually get. You might talk about it later on an intellectual level. The first thing you do is you feel. What does it make you feel? And horror does the same thing because sometimes I think uh, you will find that the, uh, the intellect is part of the problem. You know, if somebody asks you what's wrong, you go, I, bleh, I can't articulate it. I don't have an answer for you. But you can feel something in music and it can change your feelings and your emotions in one note. And I think the horror film allows us to exercise some of that nasty stuff on a very primal level. And it also uh, allows us to think about it later on. And so that's a little bit of uh, the kind of thing that I really enjoy about horror. And uh, yes, I think about it a little bit differently than some folks do. I think that's great, though, because you have a unique and interesting perspective to it where, like you mentioned earlier, about how some people are just in the blood, guts, and gore area of it. Other people are in, you know, whatever other, you know, the more sci-fi part of it kind of thing. And you're just kind of like, all of it makes sense and matters at the same time. Uh, the thing for me is, as, as I said off air, um, I saw the first Nightmare on Elm Street film when I was six years old. My parents had been divorced for four years at that point. My, they divorced when I was two, so I didn't really have that whole, like, I just knew I was going with my mom, and I went to see my dad on weekends, if possible, kind of thing. And my mom just let me, I've said this on, this, on our network here for the last 12 years many times, my mom let me watch anything. Uh, it didn't matter what it was. And half the time she was watching with me, I wasn't watching it alone unless she fell asleep on the couch and Robert Stack was scaring the crap out of me on Unsolved Mysteries because Robert Stack was that kind of person and that kind of actor to, he just, you know, says, I can't deal with that now. And you jump out of your skin. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's one of those things for me where this is interesting talking to you and hearing your aspect of something that while I have a healthy respect for it, it's also my thing of it really isn't my thing. Right, right. And I, I, uh, I don't tell people that they must watch horror films. I don't think that that's a prerequisite of life. But I do think that a lot of times when you have a, an experience like you've had, or terribly valid, right? And I had the same thing, except I went in a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I was scared of it, and I couldn't. I wanted to see it again. I was somehow fascinated with that weird emotion that I felt, and it was somehow uh, a purgative for me. Uh, but I will say that. What ends up happening when you do have a scare like that? Like my wife is a sci-fi fan. She's an original Trekker, right? And so yeah. she was like, no way in hell am I watching horror films. And I remember when we were dating all those years ago, uh, <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street was weirdly enough the movie that I decided to take her to. And she kind of went into a fugue state, <laughs> just kind of like <laughs> went into a went into a, 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 some kind of pupa. But uh, she was like, I don't need to ever see that again. But after spending some time speaking with me, I was going, you know, you're probably watching horror and you don't even know it, you know, because horror is such an incredibly broad uh, genre. It really does go across to all the different kind of storylines. And what uh, defines horror is, is a terribly subjective thing, right? What scares me may not scare you. What interests me may not interest you. And uh, there is still room for uh, the, the horror experience. So I look at it as I make the definition very, very broad. If you look at the dictionary version of what the, the definition is of horror, it's an intense feeling of fear, disgust, uh, terror or dread dread being a very important word in that and so uh i say that a horror film is a movie that uh gives you those intense feelings of uh, either revulsion fear terror or dread and so that opens it up quite a bit the idea that a movie like uh, robert wise's the haunting from 1960 is a horror film as much as the texas chainsaw massacre is or uh gremlins is a horror film um, we don't like to think of it as a horror film sometimes because it's fun. But the reality is, if you look at it, you know, where it is going and what it wants to do is try to scare you. It gives you a resolution at the end. But there is a uh, you must at least what I do is I ask why. Why does the filmmaker wish to use the uh, tropes of horror to tell its story. And if it wants to tell this story, what does it want you to go home with? What energy does it want you to go home with? So uh, what I basically get at is that there are multiple styles of horror film that people watch and they don't think of it as a horror film. Alien sometimes is considered a horror film, sometimes it's not. Uh, the original Frankenstein is a horror film. The book is a horror story, but it's also a science fiction story. Uh, it depends on which direction you want to look at. It, but I find that a lot of times, whatever scares you first or mars you first, you assume that that's the depth, breadth, and scope of the horror film. And the reality is, the horror film is much more diverse than many of us will give it credit for. It's the redheaded stepchild. It does all those things we don't want it to do, <laughs> but it, that's its its form, right? If we're talking about, say, Joseph Campbell going into the woods for the hero's journey, uh, the woods don't come to you. You must go to the woods. And the woods and the scary place where he loses the dog are important to the hero's journey. And therefore, as far as I'm concerned, the horror story is as well. You don't have to dwell in it, but there is something to be said about finding the story which is going to be of interest to you. All the way back to, you know, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Disney, all the way up to uh, the most crazy torture porn that's out there. It all falls under, for better or for worse, the horror umbrella. And I think that it is telling important stories about us and the funny thing is is that for me and i'm going to relate this to steve as well because <laughs> for him he's more of he out of the two of us he's the diehard trekkie i'm more of a casual cool. trekkie where i i grew up watching next gen i'd seen a like i have not seen all of tos and i probably never will i just at this point in my cool. life i have no interest but well, hold on so for me now, though, with horror, I feel like I'm more of a lurker than anything else because I try to find the most tame horror films in the world. Like, 
the hand that rocks the cradle and um, Freddy's dead, the final nightmare. I think we can all agree for nightmare on Elm street part six was not exactly super scary. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, there, there are wonderful dread inducing horror films. I can give you a list of movies. I, I, um, there's a movie in 1987 called the lady in white. You may enjoy. Okay. It's, it's funny um, that you mentioned track because uh, a number of the films actually are, horror movies <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. um, as well as there are, you know, standalone episodes of multiple series that are that, you know, they, they may not be blood guts and gore, but they, they analyze some, you know, uh, part of the human psyche in a weird and creepy way. Oh yeah. Yes. Dr. Who almost all of Dr. Who is science fiction and horror melded together. And Doctor Who is, it's an interesting thing. I don't know if you folks know anything about Doctor Who or watch it, but uh, they, they have a Christmas show that comes out of the BBC every year. And people are like, why is that there? And it's like, that's an old time honored thing in England. And it used to be here as well, which is that there used to be a Christmas ghost story that would be told. That was tradition. And uh, part of that tradition is uh, the uh, Scrooge story. Uh, and I'm forgetting the name of the story all of a sudden. But uh, that comes out of this idea, A Christmas Carol, right? So A Christmas Carol is a ghost story. And it is a time loved. But there, it comes from like uh, M.R. James, who is an, uh, an old time writer who uh, used to come up with these ghost stories and they would tell one traditionally around Christmas. And so uh, the idea of Dr. Who comes from that. And Dr. Who is this character from another planet who takes people on these, uh, these trips, uh, kind of like, uh, the, uh, the guide, uh, on the, uh, the ferryman on the river sticks for lack of a better, uh, analogy. Oh, okay. uh, but He's usually with monsters. You know, he's usually taking on monsters. And so people talk about when they were kids watching Doctor Who, even though it's mostly called a science fiction story, uh, that they would hide behind their couch watching it because you have the Daleks, which are exterminators. You have uh, the uh, Zygons that are these sucker-faced monsters. Most of the time, uh, it's dealing with space ghosts of some sort or space monsters. So the, uh, there's a great persuasion towards uh, horror in science fiction. And like was mentioned, uh, Star Trek has many episodes like that. The, the concept of Q, anytime they're going up against gods or creatures that consider themselves gods, uh, you're, you're falling into the, the myth of the horror story. And I think it's kind of interesting and intriguing why I like both. Or like uh, the Borg. <laughs> Yeah, the Borg are absolute nightmare factories, right? In fact, uh, I, I was like thoroughly transfixed. That's what helped me get into the next generation even more. I was like, oh my goodness, look at these guys. And so why do we go there, right? Because there's something to be said about us when we look at the Borg. Uh, what do we not want to be? Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You know, There's been four versions of Invasion of the Body Snatchers over the decades, one for each interesting decade, I guess. And each of them talked about what was happening in our culture. It was all about losing identity, you know, losing what we are. What makes me me? What makes you you? Is it, uh, is it our personalities? Is it our memories? And so I'm really, I'm always intrigued by that kind of thing. And uh, I think science fiction and horror mixed together uh, really gives us uh, a lot of possibilities. And I think uh, movies like uh, and stories like Invasion of the Body Snatchers land purely in the horror milieu. They use science fiction as a way to uh, separate the myth from the reality what's happening like mccarthyism or uh commercialism that uh, the the me generation and s and things like that yeah absolutely yeah that's yeah that's definitely i think part of what creates that draw with people yeah I, I I like to think so. Um, and if I'm talking too much, as you can tell, I don't have a problem talking. <laughs> Let me know when you want to ask a question. <laughs> I, I haven't been talking for almost a year at this point, except in short bursts. So I'm, you know, I'm about ready to explode myself. So, uh, you know, the, the, like I said before, I'm kind of on the fringes of horror. Um, 
honestly, I'm more into not full on horror comics, but I realize that because of the company that I work with or have worked with in the past, uh, Xenoscope Entertainment, who does the Grim Fairy Tales comics, um, I like I'm fine with all of that because it's magic and horror and everything kind of all in one. I'm fine with that, but it's just something about TV and movies that the horror genre just I respectfully backed away. <laughs> um, you hit on something really important uh, because I talk about horror, uh, not only movies. I mean, most of the time I end up speaking about movies cause that's what everybody basically, uh, touches on. It's, it's the most, uh, it's the mashed potatoes of the world of entertainment movies. But, uh, the, the thing that I like to say is, you know, I wasn't watching horror movies and R rated films or anything. When I was a kid, I was reading. So oh, comic books, uh, Tales from the Crypt, uh, some of the er- early Batmans or the Batmans from the 70s had some really horrific ideas in them. Uh, there was Creepy Magazine uh, and uh, uh, House of Secrets all and the, uh, the Dracula, the Marvel run of Dracula, which was absolutely magnificent, done by the great Gene Cole. And he was one of my favorite cartoon, uh, one of my favorite dra- uh, artists, that is. Yeah. And uh, all of those were truly great. And they were absolutely terrifying but there is something that is different between reading a book and watching a movie you're kind of on a out of control train when you're watching a movie whereas a book you're willingly putting your toe deeper and deeper into the tub every page that you're reading and you have the opportunity to to, uh stop at any time but you also have uh the the two-edged sword of it is that your mind will think of things far more horrible than any effects budget could possibly give when you're reading something that is a book. But that's the quiet revolution. I was in a household that was uh, highly fundamentalist, right? So there were many things I was not allowed to do. But my dad was functionally illiterate. And so he looked at books as homework. And I ended up being someone who was a reader. So he never understood why anybody would read a book for pleasure. And he looked at books as very toothless and tame and boring. He had no clue it was in books. And that's where the quiet revolution happens. All my bad habits, all my nasty thoughts came from books first. That was the first corrupter. And so when I went to the library and I started, I started in science fiction. I started Asimov A and just worked my way through. But I found Mm -hmm. the horror section kind of lost myself in there. And uh, all of that stuff was where I got so many of the ideas. And it's a interesting place to go. I think it's just as enriching as any horror film. It's another way that you can have your dose of horror and deal with it well. You know, comic books are a wonderful in between the novel and the and the uh, and the film. Absolutely, I remember, and you 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 probably remember this as well. Uh, one of the books that scared me so much as a kid in reading was John Belair's The Curse of the Blue Figurine. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh my, like like that book gave me nightmares um, so it really really great. did and it was and you're right the reading of horror of horror is i think it whether it's comics whether it's actual reading books and just leaving it up to your imagination i think i had read a short story in 88 when i was eight years old that then gave me a nightmare of a wolfman in my closet the next thing i know i'm being rushed to the hospital because i had a seizure Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I was just about to say that it's a great starter for folks. Anybody who's uh, listening and is like, well, I don't know, maybe I'll be interested in reading something. But I would say go to anthology books because uh, the investment of a short story is not nearly as much as it is for a novel. And a good short story is like a punch to the chest. And it can be truly uh, chilling. And then you can release yourself into the next story if you so wish. Uh, Even old stories, ones from the 40s, uh, I find can be very appealing. Uh, There's one called The Man from the South that probably everybody knows and they don't know that they know it. But I think it was a Roald Dahl story. And it was about a 
couple, uh, a woman and a man, uh, down in a bar in some seedy area in, in South America. And there's this guy, this diminutive fellow in a white suit. And uh, he's uh, the uh, couple are sitting there and they're kind of brash Americans in this place. And this guy keeps flicking his lighter lazily. And this man in the white suit comes over and he goes, I will give you my car if you can get that lighter to light 10 times in a row without failing. Do you feel strongly about that? All I ask, and if you think that you're really tough, is I want to be able to have you tie your hand down with your pinky extended. And I will take a knife and a, or a hatchet and I will cut off your pinky if you miss a beat. Do you feel like you're a gambling man? And it becomes this whole story of wits, but it's all about can he light this thing uh, 10 times? That story is ancient. And yet when you're reading it, as improbable as it sounds that anybody would get into that, you are completely engrossed in it. And there are uh, tons of old stories like that that can really chill you without even having to go to ghosts and demons and monsters. Absolutely. Absolutely. So – with with you having this this book called Screaming for Pleasure, what are some gems in your book that people can hope to uncover as they dive in? <laughs> well, uh, what I talk about a lot is trying to uh, – first off, I mean it's called uh, How Horror Makes You Happy and Healthy. Well, how does it make you – healthy, right? Happy and healthy. But it's not going to cure lumbago, right? I'm talking more about uh, trying to find, and it's just like any kind of geekery, right? It's the idea of finding your passion and feeling complete in that passion. So uh, when I talk about uh, making it ha happy and healthy, it's talking about the little things in life, really, the emotional release that you can have through a horror story. Uh, you can find a way to uh, take a look at some of the darker sides of yourself and uh, come to terms with that. Find out that it's okay. Find out that there are no bad emotions. They're just emotions. There are bad things that you can do around those emotions, but the emotion themselves uh, are, are not out to hurt you. Uh, they are there for you to be able to figure out uh, a good way to live your life. Uh, but there's also the idea of a sense of play. So many of us as adults lose a sense of play. People who are geeks, you know, fellow geeks, understand that a sense of play will stay with you as long as you keep with your passions. Horror is just as much a, a viable uh, and a place to find your passions as, as anything else. Uh, you also find a tribe, right? You're able to find people who have the same kind of feelings as you do about story. And if you are gravitating towards a story that a lot of people tend to look at, uh, look down their nose at, you kind of find that you uh, have a, uh, a mentality of uh, uh, really feeling a kinship with people who are in that same boat. So if you're feeling a little bit better about yourself, you find that you get yourself a community you're able to find a sense of play. It sounds like you have a pretty good life. And that's what I think happens with horror. So I talk a lot about how the first kiss is in you. Uh, and uh, we all have our own corruptors. And at some points, we find ourselves in science fiction. Sometimes we find ourselves in fantasy and romance. Uh, sometimes we find ourselves in straight drama. Sometimes we find ourselves in football, right? In sports, another geek art that uh, is just uh, somehow uh, more uh, socially acceptable. But at the same point, it is a geek art to uh, put someone else's name on your jacket and your jersey and, and walk around and uh, ex ex extend the, the virtues of them. There's not much of a difference between that and a Klingon badge, quite honestly, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it all comes from a uh, concept of uh, having passion. So I talk about whether it be movies or it be music or it be books, there's something out there waiting for you. Uh, and uh, we kind of need it. Uh, horror has been around since the beginning. The first campfire, I like to say, and I talk about that in the book, where uh, the first story is the elder around the first campfire going, thank you, everyone, for being here. Praise the earth. Praise the fire. Praise the animals and the food that we have. We are all family. We have strength. Uh, we are strong together. Thank you for all being here, tribe. And the second story is, whatever you do, don't go into those woods. There's a monster in those woods. Stay with us. Don't go out there. So that means that the horror story is the second story. It's the cautionary tale. And the cautionary tale is important to our growth. And so I look at uh, finding that thing that speaks for us. Why is horror so old? Uh, because I believe it fulfills a need in society. It's not a cultural need. 
it's not a social need. It's a human need. We have a need to uh, be able to question the brightness of the dark, uh, of the light. Uh, the only way that you have uh, shadows is through light. So being able to go into the darkness and finding the thing that is actually affirming is a lot of what I talk about in there as well. But I, of course, talk about lots of movies and I talk about a lot of uh, nasty movies as well as sweet movies and movies that uh, deal more in dread uh, than they do anything else. And uh, in case you guys wanted to have a list, I was trying to figure out what you might want. Uh, so uh, we all know the old movies. Uh, and if you're a horror fan, there's plenty that I could talk about that you're like, yes, I've seen those. A lot of horror fans will say that there aren't any good movies now. So what I did is I made a list of the movies that probably uh, not only show the broadness of uh, storylines that horror can take and the styles that it can take, but also these movies are only five years old or less. Oh, wow. And uh, I've probably got 30 of them that you could watch. Oh, wow that have different styles to them, you know, uh, and movies that are more horror, uh, that are straight up horror that you would normally expect, uh, movies that are more psychological, uh, movies that are hammer films. If you folks know anything about hammer films, the old Dracula, uh, England, uh, movies from England, uh, that had big castles and women in, and bodice rippers. Basically they're wearing those, those wonderful uh, dresses that show off a little bit too much cleavage. Uh, those kind of movies with the high romance factor, uh, to movies that are more about the, uh, psychological dread of guilt and grief. One of the things that I think is really interesting about horror movies now is that they are dealing in the, unpopular, uncomfortable emotions, putting those into the main characters. So it used to be where it was, well, I'm just an innocent guy kind of walking down the street and what happens? There's an ax murder. But now there's movies about cowardice. There's movies about grief, lots of movies about grief, movies about how hard it is to be a parent. Mm -hmm. And these are the monsters. These are the stressors that are in these movies now. And I find it great. And there's still the uh, the science fiction side. There's still the uh, demonic side, the monster movie side. And because we have streaming now, as well as cinema, as well as what's on the Internet, uh, as well as YouTube and Alter, which is a, uh, a uh, part of YouTube that's all devoted to horror. There are so many different avenues. There are so many different streams. Whereas uh, maybe in the 80s, you could say, ah, most horror movies were slasher films. And they were because there were only a few areas that horror was coming from. Now people are able to watch uh, Asian horror films as easily as they could uh, a movie that was made in Canada or in the United States due to streaming services like Amazon and Netflix and Shudder, which is a 24-hour, uh, 360 for all horror all the time channel uh and that channel will show you all the different styles that are out there so if we were like to say to look at uh, 2015 just five years ago uh we've got a movie like crimson peak which is a guillermo del toro film most people know at least the name guillermo del toro yeah. uh he's He's the king of the monsters, but he made a movie that was basically like an old Hammer film about a uh, romantic cursed love and ghosts inside of an old mansion up on the hill that uh, has this weird tendency to have iron deposits come up uh, through the snow. So it looks like blood all the time around it. It's one of the most beautiful films that you'll see. Very melodic and lyric. It's not going to scare you. It's there to enthrall you with the poetry of horror. And I think the poetry of horror is very important to speak of. There is a way to speak about the un, uh, untantalizing portions of our lives, the things like abuse, child abuse, and uh, death that can be turned into something romantic through the poetry of horror. And so Crimson Peak is very much a supple, uh, delicious bouquet of visual imagery. And then there's a movie like The Invitation, which is about the death of a child and cults. And it is a very disturbing story of a uh, father who uh, has uh, divorced his wife. She has left him for a long period of time because of the death of their child. And all of a sudden he gets an email from her and a phone call. It says, I'm back in town. I would love to have you and your new girl 
come to see how I'm doing and that I'm okay and that I found friends. And she ends up uh, having been involved in a cult and she's trying to get him involved as well. And it is this story where you're not sure through the entire film, is he paranoid? Is he having flights of fancy? Is he so uncomfortable being around his old love and being uh, having the, the scabs torn from the death of his child? Or is there really something truly diabolical going on inside of this house? It's a really interesting uh, story. The Witch is another one that came out that same year. Uh, the Witch, or A New England Tale, as it's called, is a story that uh, tries to show itself as if it is happening in the 1600s, back when we have nothing but Puritans in, in, in the world here in the United States. And it's just the colonies. And we have a family that leaves the village because uh, the Puritans aren't pure enough for this father. So he decides to go out and, and do some homesteading himself. And while he's out there, he brings all the superstitions of witches into the woods where he lives. And what's interesting about The Witch is it can be looked at in two different ways. It's either a, a movie full of supernatural or it is all about a family slowly going crazy in the isolation of the woods in a world where the only reality is the Bible. These are all happening in the same year. The uh, Lazarus Effect is a story about uh, the uh, the acid tests that the uh, uh, CIA were doing back in the 70s and 80s. And that's been uncovered now. But this is a whole story about maybe that opened up a different dimension. Maybe acid uh, highs and the trips that are there are really a portal into a different place. What if whatever you saw actually stepped out into the real world? Very interesting idea for that. And uh, ghost stories, demon stories, there are stories in just one year that go across the idea of suspensers, uh, in real world situations, uh, movies that are uh, you are here uh, happening as if they're uh, on camera. Uh, you have movies that are coming from different eras. Uh, you have uh, horror that is based in the supernatural demons. You have real serial killer types. Uh, you have movies where it may all be happening inside of someone's head. And there are movies that are happening uh, not only in the United States, but are happening across the world. And that's one year. Uh, and that's just half of the movies that I could talk about from uh, 2015, let alone where we go from there. And so there's almost an endless fountain of uh, story ideas that horror can do. There are tropes, there are cliches, but there is always a way to transcend them. And the good thing about horror is it never throws anything away. It's kind of like the great garbage collector <laughs> and it turns things <laughs> yeah. into art by, by continuing to uh, change everything that it touches into uh, a new storyline. Absolutely. Um, yeah. In, in a year where mm, this year has kind of been horrific for most people Earlier, you mm -hmm. mentioned a movie, I think you might have mentioned this off air, I don't remember, that looks like it was done on Zoom. Talk about that a little bit. What was that movie? Oh, yeah, that's that's great. Uh, so Host is a movie that was made in the UK, and it's uh, entirely done on Zoom. So one of the things that Ahar is great at is that, uh, like I said, it doesn't throw anything away. It can't help but comment on what's going on uh, because it is already working in the world of fancy, and it is already working on uh, an idea that the rules of physics don't necessarily have to apply. Uh, you are allowed to take a look at the world world through a distorted mirror. And so uh, it, uh, horror tends to be the place where uh, a lot of what's going on in the world first breaks into popular culture. And so this movie host is basically shot on uh, a Zoom. And so there's a Zoom meeting. Each of the uh, actors was responsible for recording their part. So just like any Zoom meeting, uh, the movie starts with people slowly coming on. And 
it's where horror gets very interesting. Uh, we are so used to the lexicon of what uh, movies are supposed to look like, what YouTube is supposed to look like, uh, and what Zoom is supposed to look like. Those are visual styles that are now part of cinema, whether we want it to be or not. There has been so much that's happened on Zoom that we are now very much uh, acquainted with the look of a Zoom meeting, uh, where it used to be something that would be tacky, uh, maybe the lighting didn't look great. We now make, uh, like found footage films, we now make concessions for that because that is part of our reality at this point. It doesn't have to look like it's a 35 millimeter film that's uh, done perfectly. So using all of the limitations and the expectations that we have around Zoom, they created a really interesting horror movie. One of the things that they did is they created a time bomb that's in, in the movie by using one of the free versions of Zoom. In other words, your movie is only going to be an hour and 10 minutes long. Once they start the interview and start recording, there is a timer, right? They're going to run out of time. So no matter what is happening on the screen, you are aware that you may not see what happens to everybody. You may not be able to find out what's going on, and that adds attention immediately. People are using uh, fake backgrounds, you know, green screen backgrounds, and yep. all of that becomes integral to the story. So people are coming on, and they're all getting together because they can't get together. They're in different areas, and one of them wants to do a seance. So they ask a friend who's the hippy-dippy one out of them to bring an uh, actual medium. To the thing, And, of course, they're making jokes about it. They're doing all of this stuff. And the woman says, light a candle. You see everybody lighting the candles. And she's taking it very seriously. The person who's invited her is taking it seriously. But many of the friends are openly mocking this person. And that person's trying to uh, do this as nice as possible. They have a lot of fake uh, jumps in the very beginning where you're like, oh, my God, is this where it's going to go down this traditional path? And it's not a new story, right? We've had the idea of a seance going bad from the very beginning of horror films. <laughs> and yet putting it in this new vein puts this sense of immediacy to it. There is a feeling of not acting that's happening, which adds a certain feeling of you are there. You're watching it probably on your computer. You may be watching it on your TV, but you're not in a movie theater. So already you have this square, which is a little bit different than going into the cinema. You may be watching it alone. So suddenly you are in that Zoom meeting. And what ends up happening is one person makes fun out of the undead, right? Whatever has decided to come. And perhaps, perhaps it is finding its way through the technology and showing up in everybody's house. And what it does is it does not do anything huge. It uses uh, the technology that Zoom has, people picking up their laptops, walking into a dark room, and just the idea of how unnerving it is to be watching a bunch of people who don't look behind them, but you are seeing behind them the entire time. And so all of these little things that are the essentials of, like chat and people just dropping off because the Wi-Fi gets weak, uh, having a noise happen off screen, uh, having fake backgrounds, uh, having uh, people putting on uh, – oh, my goodness, I'm forgetting what it's called – where you have like fake rabbit ears pop on your face <laughs> while you're doing it. Yeah. All the, yeah, having those little things become integral to the scares of the plot and that there's a ghost in the machine – now this thing is in there. Makes for a very interesting horror film that speaks directly to the quarantine times. And there are a couple movies that are speaking to the quarantine times. There are movies that came out a while ago. That uh, Horror has been talking about this for quite a while, knowing full well that we were dodging bullets for many years. Uh, the avian flu, all of these things. Over, We just barely missed the pandemic over and over and over again. We call it zombie apocalypse. We call it whatever we want. But we have been talking about uh, nature or the things that we can't see, the, the mighty microbe, uh, giving us a history lesson, <laughs> reminding us that we're just kind of renting here. We're renting space on this planet. It's really theirs. And uh, that anxiety has come to a, a head in, during the quarantine. And so several of the films of the past, even going back to the zombie films of this, uh, the late 70s, uh, they 
speak to where we are right now in our cubes and our cognitive dissonance where we are in an apocalypse where there's still takeout. What the fuck? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if I can you, swear. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> But yeah, we, uh, we're in this era uh, where uh, who would have thought that the apocalypse would have such cognitive dissonance that we would still have – our essential workers wouldn't be firemen and policemen. It would be the Amazon truck driver. Yeah, that is the weirdness, the carryout person. Somehow this is the essential worker in this mad world that we're in right now. And so we have this – just enough normalcy – to kind of not realize that we're in the middle of a quarantine until we realize that we're in the middle of a quarantine. And that's where anxiety comes from. And that's where horror thrives. So movies like Host, I think, are speaking directly to the times, almost to the minute of what's happening right now. Absolutely. So what are your top three suggestions of things to check out this season as we come upon Halloween here soon? Oh, well, if I were to, uh, one of the things that I want to do is cater to what I'm hearing from, from you, uh, which is that you don't want to have a bloodbath. You're looking for something that uh, would be more chilling uh, than uh, absolutely terrifying, and yet still be in the realm of horror, where you can feel that poetry. And I had mentioned a movie earlier uh, from the 80s, and that might be a little bit too old, but uh, it's a movie called The Lady in White. And it's mm-hmm. a ghost story, and it's set in, I think, New Jersey. But it is a wonderful, old-fashioned, romantic ghost story. But it also, it's not just a ghost story. It's also about a serial killer, uh, and it's also about the civil rights movement. Uh, there's a lot going on in this one little horror film that nobody's ever heard of. There's also what I would say, uh, if you uh, become intrigued in just putting your foot into the the depths of horror a little bit. Stranger Things is a great place to start. Uh, It has the nostalgia of the 80s, but it has a very Stephen King feel to it. I've heard so much, and I've heard so many people try to tell me, oh, you have to watch Stranger Things. You love the 80s, blah, blah, blah. And I'm (laughs) like, yeah, but it's a horror show. I'm not into horror. And yes, I know that there are episodes that are less scary than others and everything else. And I've seen various things. It's just, that's one of those shows where I'm like, I need to wait until like 2025 if we're still here and the show's already been canceled and nobody's talking about it for me to be able to sit down and real. Oh, Five years ago in 2020, when the world was ending, you guys were right. I should have watched this then. (laughs) Well, I will say that uh, the thing that's interesting about uh, and what really good horror does often is it disarms you from the horror. It gets you involved in the characters. And the great thing about Stranger Things is that the horror kind of sneaks up on you and it's not super uh powerful it's not in gory it's have you seen the movie poltergeist long time ago yeah so it has kind of the essence of poltergeist where there's a child who's missing and it's the friends who are coming to try and rescue so it has that kind of feel to it the goonies you could uh, see it as the goonies or monster squad another uh Mm -hmm. horror film that's more about kids uniting uh it's not nearly as terrifying as something like the uh new version of it which uh wants to scare you and does a pretty decent job of it stranger things is more about the characters and the dilemma that's there you can call it fantasy at certain points, but it certainly has its uh, its heart deeply steeped in horror. But it allows you an entry if you're not a horror fan like my wife by uh, having the characters be nerds, right? Geeks from the 80s. Mm-hmm. They're into D&D. In fact, a lot of what happens has to do with their passions. You know, perhaps the monster somehow is related to the D&D game that they're playing. Uh, There's uh, the idea of arcades. Uh, A lot of what goes on in the 80s and malls becomes 
very important to the story, but it is the fabric. The thing that uh, kind of like a Stephen King book, people always, uh, I think why many Stephen King uh, movies fail so bad is that they focus on the horror. The reality is what makes Stephen King's stories great are the characters and how we are in internal dialogues with those characters. What is said or thought on the interior of those characters is what is indelible of those stories. It's really not about the big plastic monster that comes up. And so the evil of the men that is in the uh, Stephen King story is what's important. And I think the same thing happens with uh, Stranger Things. You find yourself thoroughly invested in all of the characters and everybody, including the adults, are nerdy. And if you grew up in the 80s at all, uh, mm-hmm. You will know these characters. What I love about it is it's not the 80s of like some kind of wonderful or even the breakfast club. Those were kids that were obviously from the richer parts of the suburbs. The Stranger Things kids are the ones that shopped at Sears, right? The parents and the adults have weird haircuts of the time. They all went to <laughs> supercuts. They didn't go to hairstylists. It wasn't the time of the day glow colors. It's really uh, that wonderful moment that happened in the mid 80s where everything was awkward. We weren't in the 70s anymore and we hadn't yet fallen into the Michael Jackson glam. We're in this spot where people are wearing keds and people are riding uh, motocross bikes and uh, BMX bikes. And you're staying after school with a science teacher and the science teacher has a pocket protector and he's just as geeky as you. And so you get all of those feelings and you're invested long before the monster appears with tentacles. So that makes the monster more believable, right? Yeah, there's a um, very short, um, there's this movie in its sequel uh, FX and FX2 with Brian yep. Dennehy and uh, oh my my boy uh, Brian Brown. Brian Brown, yep, plays uh, Raleigh Tyler, who's this retired FX you know horror FX man. Yep. I love that movie more because it's more of a like a mystery cop thing than horror. But the fact that he's a retired FX you know horror FX person, I absolutely love that. Um, tell us a little bit. Okay, so your book is currently out now. Yes. Yes, you can get it in uh, at Amazon, any of those places. But if you're kind of a, a book lover and you're a little geeky like me, uh, if you go to hellbentforhorror.com and you go to the book page, uh, the ISBN number is there. And if you have a a local bookstore that's struggling to stay alive amongst all those Amazon folk, all you need to do is take that ISBN number and -hmm. you can order it through them. And uh, that helps out the the small book lovers and uh, small bookstore. So as I've been listening to you, sir, over the last hour of this interview, I'm wondering why you did not record the book for Audible, because I would love to listen to you read the book to me. (laughs) Well, it's so funny that you would say that, because uh, I am uh, in process of trying to do that. So uh, one of the things that I want to do is uh, put that out. I actually have... um, I've been going to conventions of recent uh, virtual conventions, and I'm going to have a book reading tomorrow, actually, at the Torrance uh, Library. Uh, And if you folks want to, uh, you guys actually uh, are interested in going, I can see about giving you the the uh, Zoom address. Uh, But I'm going to be reading 20 minutes of uh, uh, one of the chapters from my book. It's going to be a video version. So basically, I made a mini movie. And it's about my father and I going to see John Carpenter's The Thing in 1982 and how that movie was uh, that was a spot where horror split between generations. And it was obvious that there was an outrage from one generation and a my goodness, I feel like I got hit by a car, yet I'm really excited to the younger generation. And so that is me reading uh, from the book. And uh, I'm going to be doing more and more of those. But yes, I'm going to be doing that tomorrow. I think it's 24 minutes long, the video. And it's uh, about the experience of bunches of fathers and sons showing up at a uh, a uh, movie theater in Wilkesburg, Pennsylvania, uh, assuming that they're going to all have a bonding experience. And it ended up being <laughs> damn near a riot. Dads <laughs> were so upset. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Before we let you go, how can our listeners find you online and the various projects that you have coming up, if there are any that you can speak about besides the ones you just mentioned? Well, very good. If you're interested in finding out more about what's going on, you can go to hellbentforhorror.com. Uh, it's also the Facebook page, Hellbent for Horror. You can find that on Facebook. And in Twitter land, it is Hellbent Horror. Uh, you can find me on Instagram as well. Uh, but if you go to the website, uh, you can find all the podcasts. They're all available. Uh, there is a YouTube page, so there are video versions of those. Some of them are actual uh, full videos, and others are just the audio with a little bit of a background uh, that's there. Uh, but on my page is an events page on my website, that is. And if you go to the events page, you will see uh, where I'm going to be. Uh, I, most of them have uh, kind of finished up because I'm super busy during October. Uh, and once Halloween comes, it's time to rest a little bit. Although I do have lists of uh, my uh, horror movies for Christmas that I like to do. Uh, you can find that uh, I will be at, uh, like I said, the library, uh, but that's going to be happening tomorrow. It probably won't be uh, on uh, this won't be recorded or out there broadcast by then. Uh, but if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the book, uh, if you're interested in finding out my speaking engagements, if you're interested in just listening to the podcast, hellbentforhar.com is the best place to find everything that is uh, all roads lead to Rome. And so all roads lead to Hellbent for Har. And uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions that are posted to me on the uh, website as well. Awesome. Awesome. So we would like to thank you, Scott, for taking the time to chat with us here in this KeatCast Radio Presents interview. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And for those that are listening, you can visit the website and see how you can connect with him and discover more about his book. And until next time, unleash the geek in you. Ah. Get it? Streaming for... Never mind. <laughs> <laughs>